Uh, can you guys hear me okay on you on you on Zoom? Okay, welcome, welcome everyone. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing that, and I'm gonna do a, a. I'm gonna try to go through this fairly quickly because some of this I think some some folks here may have seen before, but I will run through it very quickly. Okay, there we go. I got to go back here and share my screen. It's a it's a multi step process here. And we're now good on Zoom. And we should be ready to go. If the. Uh... If the. Um... Sorry, I can't get the, the clicker thing here to go. Oh, I think I know what the problem is. I'm sorry. I think I have this in the background. There we go. Now we need to do this to this to this. Well, for some reason, this isn't working right, so I'm just going to have to do it this way. So I took some pictures of this. I'm just going to jump through these very, very quickly because you can go back and see them in the back. So th these were basically two kinds of buildings. What I'm going to do is go through kind of how they got constructed and how the thought process was. Um, most of you really know me, so I don't need to go through this. This is the California Central Coast. It's an ON30 group. Um, we do layouts in a number of places. Um, I'm also part of the ACCRS out in Pleasanton doing O scale there. Um, on the California Central Coast, I started off by doing a module that was very much Sierra and then got more into the bottom two or more Central Coast. Uh, the tunnel, the uh, Mission Tunnel in Santa Cruz and Wilder Ranch, which is just north of Santa Cruz, trying to do those as modules. Um, what happened was that about the same time I joined the NMRA, started looking at things to do here, and two things happened. I bought a 3D printer, and Earl started showing things off at, at meets here, and I started beginning to realize that you could do a lot better quality than I've been doing and other things that I'd started out with. Um, at the same time, we needed a new modules for the layout and for the ON30 layout, wanted to have a module that had more operating capabilities. So one of the things I wanted to do is get, you know, a number of sidings on a number of places to do switching to, make it a larger module. Um, I had a whole bunch of things I wanted. You can read through them there. They were all kind of around the idea of kind of a harbor scene and a more California harbor scene. So went through a whole bunch of designs. Um, this is actually the, the module. You can see the picture at the bottom. Um, so it kind of is designed to to mimic being at Moss Landing. So Moss Landing silted up in 1906 when the river, river mo moved south by five miles. The earthquake moved the river south. Uh, what happened was it closed up. They did. They actually excavated in, I think it was 47, as part of the post-war building harbors on the coast. Um, I've kind of reimagined that that happened in the teens. So that lets me have a harbor. Um, for those of you who've been to Moss Landing, a uh, little square there where you see the, the purple square, that's essentially where the Duke power plant is now. So if you look right in front of that, actually in the Pajaro Valley Railroad, you can see it on the one on the left pretty clearly, actually ran through there and had a Y. You can see the Y right here. Uh, for those of you online, you're not gonna see this marks, but you can see the Y right here that ran out across to the sandbar and then they had a wharf there. Um, so they actually were using that. This was this was pre-1906, pre the earthquake. Um, so what I've done is I basically laid out that the module could have theoretically been there. Um, some module construction pictures. I'm just going to skip over these, except that the buildings were built as boxes. Um, did that because that way you could drop them in and out. I wanted to be able to take them off the module because when you put these things on a trailer, especially when you run a U-Haul trailer that's designed to carry 3,000 pounds, you put about 500 pounds of modules in, they get destroyed. Um, this bounce so much is terrible. So the buildings were could get damaged. So I decided I wanted to make the buildings removable. So you can see there's a base there. 
and then there's masonite and there's a block of wood that fits into the base so the buildings actually can be removed. Uh, got a whole bunch of prototype photos. Um, so these are some, what was interesting was in 1906, because of the earthquake, they took a bunch of photos of things that nobody ever took photos of because they all of a sudden got interesting as they were damaged by the earthquake. So if you look at the upper left photo, that's actually the Y that's on the mainland side of that bridge that runs over. So you've got the railroad bridge on the left, you've got the road bridge or the cart bridge. And you can see this was actually a stub switch and it bent during the rail during the earthquake. Um, and you can see that on the other side, there was the wharf area kind of to the left there and some other buildings. The picture at the upper right is actually back towards the um, back towards the mainland. So you see the same two bridges, but taken the other way. And you see the kind of buildings that were there. Um, I also found as I was looking at these pictures, I was looking for something for a fuel dock for a uh, for a the uh, some fishing boats. And I found this fuel dock in, in Monterey. Um, this was actually the standard oil fuel pier. And it turns out that it was an L off of the main pier. So when a boat was parked there, you could actually go back and take a great picture across the water of the boat but from the pier. So what happened is the, the fishermen were primarily Sicilians. They'd have a big family day and invite everybody down to the ship and take them out on, on Monterey Bay on the fishing boat. And they'd park at the pier and they'd all take pictures of them. So I've got all these great pictures of the Standard Oil Pier. And that's actually the little building that you see over there. I got a couple of pictures at the end that's actually that building at the end of the pier. Um, I use PowerPoint, not going to talk about that, did a separate talk on, on doing this and how you use PowerPoint to do modeling. What you see there in red are all the pictures of these models and how they were kind of designed in PowerPoint. Um, these are actually the four buildings on the, on the module. Um, the two we're going to talk about are the two on the left. The upper right is a uh, cannery kind of model after the Hobden cannery, which became the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And then the lower right is that standard oil building. What's interesting is the picture there is actually the paper version of that, which was the mock-up, which actually looks pretty good. It's actually on the layout now in Pleasanton. So, because when you get about five feet away, it looks good. So these were the two buildings. Um, I built a pier and I wanted them up kind of against the pier with the idea that you could be loading, loading into them. The right building is designed to follow those buildings you saw earlier, the white ones, and is intended to be a Spreckles sugar warehouse. So the idea was Spreckles had a beet refinery um, first, it was in Salinas, and then they actually built a town called Spreckles. Um, they had a whole bunch of sugar. They did raw sugar. They didn't do final refining. That was done up in San Francisco because they originally, the business was doing sugar in Hawaii, shipping raw sugar to San Francisco, processing it for distribution there. So when they built the beet refiners, they kept the same process. The problem was that the SP was basically, they had usury rates to ship. So the idea here is that they would ship some percentage of the sugar by ship. So it gives me a great reason to have lots of rail cars come in and bring sugar and have them on the dock and then have a ship coming. So you look at the content of a ship versus the number of rail cars. Turns out it takes 10 to 15 narrow gauge rail cars to fill in a small size ship. So it becomes a, an interesting kind of model. The left is actually Daniel's uh, express transfer. He was, this is actually a business in Santa Cruz back in about 1915. Um, so I started by building the buildings out of acrylic. So I figured if they were going to be removable, they were going to handle a lot. You don't want to build a stick built, they're going to fall apart. So I thought this, I'd seen people using acrylic, thought oh, that's a great idea, I do eight bits of acrylics. So I built all three buildings out of acrylic. So the two buildings that are over there, you can see uh, built out of acrylic here. That's actually the Hobden Canneries, the third one. Um, very simply, cut it on a table saw. Um, the key to cutting acrylic on a table saw is really simple. Set your blade a nanometer higher than the acrylic, so it's not cutting down on it; it's scraping it up. And that way, if you touch your, if you put your blade up this high, when the, when the bits come down, they hit the acrylic, and where the corners of the bits hit, it cracks the acrylic. If you put it exactly the height of the acrylic, just a tiny bit higher, it just scrapes away the acrylic. And you get clean cuts. Uh, and by the way, I put tape on it. If you don't have the original plastic backing, just put masking tape on it too, and that helps keep it from cracking. So combination of masking tape and setting the blade height. Um, I also have one of those scroll saws that I had from being a kid, quite frankly, and use that for all the cuts that were in the middle or like where you had to go in and cut a window. Uh, so that's one of those little buzz, it goes up and down scroll saws that used to get for 69 bucks. I don't know if you can buy them anymore. Um, put them together just with the brass clamps you buy and then use the glue that you get from um, 
that you get from uh, um, cap plastics. I bought the plastic. All the plastic came out of the, the bargain bin there, the pre-cut scrap pieces. Um, by the way, if you know someone with a laser cutter, laser cutting this stuff is really great because you can actually laser cut it with tabs on the end and then just push those together and then hit it with the glue and it's going to be perfect. Put a little bit of square on it, it'll be perfect. So um, you know, it's a great way to build a building with the acrylic as the outside. Um, this was the first building. That's the red one back there. Um, I started this one first because it was the easiest. Basically, the outside is covered with board and batten northeastern siding. Um, cut it, cut in where I wanted windows. Um, the windows there that you see, you know, those are just cut. The plexiglass, the acrylic is there and the window frames. Sanded them, just took some sandpaper and sanded them until I got the mullions as low as I could. The mullions, the upper ones are off just a tiny a bit, but you quite frankly can't see it. Um, and I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. Um, once I had the outside done, then I did the inside. The inside is just scribe siding. Um, just cut it to match. So basically just this little bit of measuring to try to get it all to match up well. The outside was stained after it was put on. Oh, by the way, all this was put on with epoxy. I got one of those tubes of epoxy, squirt out about a quarter of an inch, half an inch, mix it up with a, with a toothpick, spread it on and spread it everywhere on it, except right where the windows are. Squish it down, just put a weight on it, and it'll never come off. And the beauty is it'll never bow or anything because it's so glued on to the plexiglass, nothing will happen. Um, the outside was kind of semi-dry brushed with a wine-colored acrylic, the cheap stuff from the hobby store. Um, the inside is basically alcohol with uh, leather dyes. Um, I tried to get it kind of a redwood look. The beauty of doing this on acrylic is as long as you use alcohol and water-based stuff, you can clean it with a, tooth, with a, uh, a Q-tip. So when you get done, you got some stuff on there where your window is, you just clean it with a toothpick and you've got a perfect acrylic to look through. So you can do all the finishing. You don't have to worry about the glazing. The glazing can be cleaned up when you get done because alcohol is fine. Uh, the other thing I did at this point was I, I did two things. I put a floor in to match the height of the ties because I decided I wanted, one of the things I wanted as a feature was I wanted a place a car could come into a building. And I know it's stupid, but I just wanted it. Um, so to get that all, so the floor was the same level as the ties. So when I put this flooring on, it would come right up against the ties. I found out the plexiglass acrylic was eighth inch was exactly the right height. So I put it in, I glued down a couple of pieces of track because I figured I had to have a way to get stuff from the track back here at the back out to the pier, which was going to be out here. And then at the same time, I put wires in at each end up to little shoes. I had some brass shoes and I basically soldered those to a piece of wire and, and then epoxied them in before I put the wood on. And so if you look at it, that's the way the power gets the lighting on the roof is it just drops in and it's just got a couple of wires. Um, so basically that's what it looks like. Um, it's, this is pretty simple construction. Um, what's neat about it is that you can now go really hog crazy on the inside because you can take it out. And, and as you see, there's tubs back there. It moves in a tub so you don't have to worry about the details falling off and getting broken. Um, I had to put in, I had to figure out a way to get things off of a flat bar. I would thought about putting a little crane in there. I didn't like the way it looked. So I thought I'd build a, a gantry and figured it needed to be built like it looked like it had been there in the 1910s. So basically just some wood, um, some pieces of plastic cut with an NBW on them, um, some styrene here finished. And this was a, I think this is an HON3 mine car that I ground the ends off of to make a carrier for the, uh, for the, the, there's a winch here. You can kind of see there's a winch right in here. Uh, so this is, I put these pictures in not to show what it looks like, but to show what's interesting is when you look at the building over there, you'll notice that it's thick, right? Because it's eighth inch plexiglass wood on either side. But what's interesting is when you looked at this picture here until I told you, did you notice that this little piece here, right here, is abnormally thick? You, well, you don't even notice it. And so it turns out the walls are thicker than they should be because walls should just be a piece of one by wood on the framing. This is actually a six inch wall on the framing, but it just turns out in, in any of these pictures where you see it, once you know it's there, you can kind of identify it. But until, if you don't know it's there, you don't identify it. Um, this is a picture inside. Um, these were all 3D printed. Um, this was 3D printed just on a filament printer. This was 
some parts table. I think I found this at an estate sale. This was a, uh, I think this was a Wiseman piece. Um, and then I built a little cart there to carry the, uh, to carry things in and out. So this is what's interesting about this construction technique is these, th this is going through the eighth inch acrylic. And so if you put a car inside up against it, so, you know, that's very close inside. I mean, you don't really see the thickness of the glass at all. Um, down here, you can see it's focused on, this is focused on the glass, not on what's inside, but you still see what's inside. Get up close here, you can see through and get a great picture. What's really interesting is if you look really close in this picture, you can see the wood that's cut on the inside and you can kind of see there's something a little weird there. But the reality is when you look at this picture, you can't see it. Um, and in fact, if you don't, if you really don't know that it's the eighth inch plexiglass, you probably wouldn't know it's there. So anyway, the roof very simply, uh, also acrylic, uh, put these gussets in. The gussets have a wire around them. That's what hits the shoe. Um, I 3D printed the uh, these trusses and put lights in. And that was actually what led to an interesting thought process. So I said, well, I need trusses, need to have something there. I'll 3D print them. Um, then I started looking at the building sitting next to it, which is actually the, it's actually sitting back there underneath the roof. Um, and it's actually a, a plexiglass box. And I said, well, that's eighth inch plexiglass. Um, I'm cutting, I'm doing eighth inch framing for the timbers. Why couldn't I 3D print all the framing for the building? Uh, that was, a, by the way, one year thought, maybe a year plus thought process to go through that. It took a long time to do it. So again, this is the building that I decided to do. It's that that warehouse. That's really the only pictures I have of it, again, taken there during that time frame. What I wanted to recreate was kind of this long, slow slung building with kind of a portico out in front and some windows on it and then some doors, because that seemed to be the kind of warehouse they had. So this was kind of the design I came up with. Um, what you see is kind of the front, the two saw ends and the back, which has uh, doors that have to be right up at the track level. Uh, so I had to figure out how to manage that inside. Uh, what I did was I divided it down because the print bed in my filament printer is only eight inches. So you had to take 20, the 20 inch piece and cut it down. At this point, I kind of decided that's how it looked and I wanted to change the design. So I moved over and did the design from there into FreeCAD. Now, quite frankly, if I was to start this again, I probably would have done it in Tinkercad. Um, but for the roof, FreeCAD was very good. FreeCAD is a um, open source version of Fusion 360. Um, and because it's open source, it has some weirdness. So the different pieces don't work exactly the same because they were written by different people. So it's a little bit different, but it's a fairly powerful CAD tool. So what you see here is actually you know, the decision was this was going to be a six inch piece of wall. This is what the framing ended up looking like for that wall. Um, so this is actually what one of the wall elements looked like in FreeCAD. Um, what you see is a couple of things that were interesting here. These holes right here, up here in the corners. I'm sorry, I got out of the picture for those of you on, on Zoom. Um, these holes up here in the corner, up here in the upper right. Um, I can actually do them this way and then everybody can see them. No, I can't. I can move it over here. Hang on. There we go. This hole right here, that's an alignment hole. So the idea is you just put a little piece of wire in it, and then when you put them together, it holds the two walls in alignment. Um, I'll go ahead and start passing that around. So you can see these are, those are three pieces, and they're glued together at the corners with epoxy. Um, so at the top, at the top up here, these pieces up here at the top are designed to hold the trusses in place. Um, and that was actually, I printed a couple of versions without that and then figured out I needed trusses. So I ended up adding those. Uh, and you'll notice that the cross piece, the cross members here are only half thickness. So they're actually designed to give some depth to the wall. And I'll talk about that a little bit more kind of in the next slide. Um, so these are the design steps in FreeCAD. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but you know, if you've ever done anything, this is it. FreeCAD and Tinkercad are different. Tinkercad is a graphic. 3D assembly kit. FreeCAD is basically a drawing package where you extrude into 3D space. So think about Tinkercad's like, like picking the yoke with Tinker, you grab the different pieces and put them together. In this, you have to draw things and extrude them. So this is, gets more complicated. But for this, it's actually not bad. So basically you draw a wall, extrude it, you remove what you don't want, which gives you this flat piece. 
I added in the windows and stuff based on some heights as individual little pieces, added in a piece over the door, added in the cross brace piece, added in across here at the top, the uh, the clips for the, uh, for the roof. So I'm not gonna make this a 3D CAD thing. It's just basically if you've done CAD, you understand how to do it. Um, so that's basically what the wall looks like. Then you take it and you put it into your, your slicer. Uh, what the slicer does is the slicer cuts this up and tells the 3D printer how to print it. Um, when I printed these, these were all printed with that small piece down. The smaller building is printed the other way around. And what that allowed me to do is put those actually on the surface and put supports. Now, when you pop the supports off, the support stuff's on the back against the wall so you don't see it. So it actually turns out that that's a, in some ways a better way to print it. And I'll show you a couple of pictures of that as well. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like. And when I'm just getting around, there is is one of the end walls done. I think that one you'll notice doesn't have any of the things on the top for the trusses. So that was an early version. Um, you see the one up here at the upper right. Um, you know, these are the three pieces. These are now glued together. These two are glued together. These are not glued at the end. They're just pinned using the pins. So I can start the assembly. Um, so I basically got to the step you see over here on the right. And that was the point at which I realized I'd screwed up because what's missing in that picture? What do you need inside a building that doesn't exist in that framing of that picture or you have to add on in some way? Lighting. And so I started looking at that and realized, oh, I can actually add lighting right into the 3D prints. So what I do is I took the trusses and added on them, you see on the upper left in the CAD design, pieces to come out with holes in them for the trusses. And then also did, if you look right here, there are alignment pins so you can put brass rods to run the power across. Um, this is, you see it printing, those are actually the clip holders for the brass rods. Um, and then over here at the upper right, this is a truss that's been finished. I'll talk about finishing a second with the lights mounted. And that's kind of what it looks like in the building. Um, and there's a small pony truss. And again, those are all mounted with pins. The beauty of these pins is you can put them in an exact place. I mean, the beauty of CAD is everything can be exactly where you want it. And it makes it really easy. Um, I did an office. There's an office in there. It was done the same way. So it was done essentially with some smaller framing because I wanted to make it look a little smaller. Um, done as three pieces. They were then had siding put on them, and then they were glued together and glued into place as the office. Uh, so very quickly, talk about texturing and coloring. So the key to this whole thing really is, when you get done printing them, the walls look like that one there. If you wanna put them in a building and have them look good, you gotta figure out how to, print, how to color them. So the first thing is a technique, and I don't remember where I read about this, but I have to give attributions. Somebody's talked about doing this. You basically use a thing called filler primer. And filler primer is, they sell it at Home Depot. They, you use it for a car. If you've got a scratch on the car, you can spray filler prime on it, sand it smooth, and then repaint it with primer and repair it. And you don't actually have to fill it. It's just enough filler to fill a scratch. Um, what you do is if you take the parts and you spray about four coats of filler primer on them, you know, spray a coat, give it about 45 minutes to dry, another heavy coat, 45 minutes, right? You get basically, you build up a coating that's almost a visible coating on the stuff. And then what you can do is you can run a razor saw along that. And if you kind of wiggle the razor saw, what you get or what you see there on the bottom right is you get actual wood grain. Now, what's really interesting is the sides of this, because remember how it's printing, it's printing with a 3D printer, which is like a toothpaste tube squeezing out. The sides are layered as you squeeze the toothpaste. So as you go up the sides, they actually get natural layers in them. The top is not. So that's what you spray with the with that the filler primer and scrape the wood grain on. Um, if you do the trusses, for example, then you have to do both sides, but the walls, you only have to do one side because the outside of the wall is going to get siding on it. Nobody's ever going to see it. So you don't have to worry about that one. You only have to do the inside uh, on the walls. Um, the finished painting, I really wanted to get kind of a redwood look, um, you know, that, that kind of aged redwood. If you had redwood in, inside of a building and you've watched it over 20 years, it doesn't go gray. The gray is actually UV. Inside of a building, they just kind of get darker red. So I was trying to get that darker. Yeah, kind of, kind of the, kind of almost what you get here. So what I did was I actually first stained the wood, and I did that with again some. I, I bought a bunch of shoe dyes from Amazon, so I got a box of shoe dyes and I mix them up in jars with with alcohol, 
And so I did it with red, and I think it was brown and mahogany were the shoe dyes that I got to get the kind of reddish look I wanted. Once I got the wood done, then I had to paint the, I wanted to paint the plastic to match the wood. So I ended up trying first doing lighter, light colors, and then doing darker dry brushing, and I found I just couldn't get it to look good. What I ended up doing was I bought this paint that's called caramel. So it's kind of a caramel red paint, um, kind of a, you know, just like a caramel like you'd buy in the store. And then you can use dark dry brushing to darken that up and finish it up. So basically that was sprayed, um, it was caramel, and then started with Vallejo wood, Vallejo mahogany, a little bit lighter and golden oak, some light brown over the top. You do a lot of dry brushing and then alternating some brown and mud craft paints on the top of that. Um, I bought that this Army Painter dry brush set. The one there, I think that this link maybe is, is a three brush set but they sell these brushes that are round and have sh relatively short bristles for dry brushing. And I find they work really well for dry brush. You get a little bit more paint in them. And what you do is use paper towel, combination of a paper towel and those brushes. It makes dry brushing much better, much easier. I'm not good at it, but I try. Um, the exterior walls basically were done. The, the wood was glued on. The wood had been finished on both sides. It had been wood grained on both sides before it was finished. Then it was just basically glued on the wall, starting at the top and working down to the bottom. Um, then the outside was done with a little bit more dark alcohol stain. And then that was also um, dry brushed with just white tube acrylic paint. And then wire brushed afterwards with, you know, one of those 299 for three of them at Harbor, Harbor Freight, those wire brushes, and just brush it on there and brush some of the paint off. And then I think I hit it with a little bit of alcohol after I got done with that to give it a little bit dark, a little bit darkening. Um, the floor, so the floor was put on first, as you see on the left. I figured out where the doors were going to be because I wanted some wood on the doors to come out. And then I cut the floor so that the the frame structure, when it's glued together, would glue right over the floor. And then the floor was epoxied on to the masonite because you got the masonite and the piece underneath it. And then this was just all sheet scribing. One of the neat things is if you take sheet scribing and you epoxy it to an underlying base, you can now take a razor knife and just go cut every board most of the way through. So all of a sudden the scribe siding goes, doesn't no longer look scribes. It looks like much more like full boards because they're all glued on underneath. And then this was, this was I, I started trying to cut the little things and I found it to be incredibly tedious. So this little tool here, uh, what I do is I just ground off the end of a blade so I got exactly the right width here so that that actually cuts one of these on the side. So you just go down, just put your straight, straight edge down and go boom, 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 and cut them off. Um, and then I put nail holes in, which is a bit, in, in O-scale, it looks, in O-scale, you kind of need to do it. Uh, and then basically the walls were glued together, and then the whole thing was epoxy down on the underlying on the underlying frame. So that makes it, you know, as I said, removable. Um, you know, I took it out of the tub and put it up on the table there just by grabbing it at the end and picking it up by the two end walls. So it's actually pretty, pretty sturdy. Um, oh, the roof. So the roof is actually a whole bunch of sections. If you look at the roof, there's actually three pieces on the back and there are actually three pieces on either side here. So there are 10 individual pieces that had to be glued together. Um, and I did it once and went through it. And then I decided I really would like to make the, the beams a little smaller. And I decided I didn't want to do it again. It was, this was one of the most horrendous math exercises I've gone through. And I'm a pretty mathy person. Uh, it was an awful lot of figuring out, trying to figure out these dimensions of how these walls come together so you can glue them, box them together was a real challenge. Uh, so the roof, basically, these were some kind of intermediate build pictures. You can kind of see the roof on there as a separate piece. Um, the roofing was just is the O, o siding. They sell, they sell two kinds of roofing. They sell a corrugated roofing and a panel roofing. Um, this was done with the corrugated roofing. I cut it to the length I wanted. I think there were 10 feet. 10, 10 feet, I think, was what I did. 10 by 4, I think. Um, then they're just, you know, put on a stick up here. Um, put on a stick up here to, to spray, find a really light gray um, primer to spray them with and use that Dr. Bins on them to rust them. Uh, so rust you wanna do individually, dirt you wanna do after they're installed. 
because rust tends to be different on the boards. And that gives you a lot of variation if you do them separately. But then when you put them in, if you want streaks of dirt coming down the roof, that's going to come across both of them. So this is just rusting at this point. Um, and then those were, I dry brushed the framing. That was a lot of dry brushing, trying to get that all dry brushed. Um, the trim pieces were just dry brushed the same way and then installed on the roof. And then the roofing was put on. Uh, what I found is if you take their seamed roofing, which has a seam and then goes about, I don't know, maybe a foot and has another seam. If you take the two seams and you cut them at the other seam, so you've got flat, seam, flat, that works really well to build a valley here. And it also is the same thing I used up here on the crown piece. So, you know, if you ever put a roof in, it's basically the same way you put the you put the valleys in first and then you just bring the roofing down to it, cut it. And I got a gray pin. I just run along the end of it with a little bit of gray just to, so you kill the silver right at the end of it. Um, and these are just some more pictures. The only thing here to show is this is that, again, that roofing cut the same way the, uh, the and then bent down. You basically bend it down and then glue it on to cover the crown. Um, these were just some construction pictures. The doors, uh, I wussed out on the front, on the doors that are to the pier. Um, if you notice on the red building, I put those in using the engine house hinges and brass rods so they're movable. The problem is every time I took it down and off, I'd knock one off. And I just didn't want to deal with eight doors falling off all the time. So I decided to make them go in. So these are actually just really simple doors. They're basically just a wood frame door with some brass here to make it look like it's a door that opens in. Um, like I said, without having a prototype with external doors, I felt I could change that. Uh, the back doors were actually sliding. They were actually, again, 3D printed. Um, what I do is put it a, a little carrier here. This is actually one millimeter thick and then has these rounds on the top that have holes through them. And then that got wood glued on it. And then after that was glued on, um, it got the, uh, the fascia on the front. Uh, those actually, what happens is that these round pieces of the top actually have a hole through them and the carrier has a hole through it. And I put a rod through there. Um, turned out, went to the hobby shop to, um, try, to Hobbies Unlimited over in San Leandro and they do a lot of model, model airplane plane stuff and they had carbon fiber rods. They didn't have any brass. I was going to buy a brass rod, but they only had carbon fiber. So I bought a carbon fiber rod, tough to cut. I cut it with my Dremel saw. But what's interesting is when you put that, that filament printer with the round hole and slide it on that carbon fiber rod, it just slides so smooth through so these doors. If you go back there around to the back and just move the doors back and forth, you'll see they're just incredibly smooth. Um, so basically that, that, you know, did the doors. Um, then I had, I realized that I had to have something inside. It's a sugar warehouse. You've got to have sugar sacks. How am I doing time wise? I'm, I'm actually doing pretty good. Uh, I had to have sugar sacks. So I, I didn't want to buy them. They're, you know, five, four dollars for 20. And a couple of them are like uh, loans that are sitting down. So you only get about 16 for your, your four dollars. That seemed a lot because it looked to me like I needed about a thousand of them. So I basically did a, you know, simple, Simple, uh, made a simple set of them and glued them in, made up a silicon mold. Um, and then I started casting them. And you see a bag here. I think I cast about 2,000 of these. I don't know. It seemed like it just, I was always casting them. One interesting thing in casting, um, we bought a, a chamber vacuum sealer to do sous vide at one point. Sous vide, you know, cooking food at, at water temperature. And they, I, they were expensive. It was 600 bucks. So I wouldn't recommend buying it for this, but I had it. And I said, you know, I wonder if that would work good for this. So what you do is if you take this, you know, with the, after you plug the resin into it, you have to put weights on it because when you let the air back into the chamber of it, otherwise it just flies around. But what you can do is you can put weights on it, take the vacuum down a bit and just let it sit there and it'll actually hold it for about two or three hours. And you just let them sit in there and it actually gets the bubbles out. So I found when I did that process, I got about a double, twice as good yield as I did without doing it in terms of getting the bubbles out of all those little, those little holes there where the, uh, where those are. Um, so then I decided I needed a pile of them, but I didn't want to pile them. So I built this 3d printed this and cut the top to kind of match. So you could put them on and they'd look good. So I had this nice box in the corner and, you know, it's one of these things that when you do this process, I find that I, I do something 
and I figure out I can do it this way and then I just don't like it. And then I stop and I think about it and I cogitate and then I come back and say, I got to do it. And the problem with that was I looked at that and what was a huge problem with that stack of sugar bags. What's the huge problem? How did they get up there? I mean, they're this tall. Would somebody throw them up there like that? So you got to have some way of getting up there. So here's the next thing. I went and I did research, try to figure out how they stack sugar bags. And you know what? There were no earthquakes, so nobody took any pictures. As far as I, I never could find any pictures of that. So I basically decided that, you know, probably they would build a ramp. So I ended up making a ramp the same way. And then I needed to have the sugar at the, the, the sacks at the end. So what I ended up doing was I ended up casting stacks of sacks. These were, I actually ACC'd a bunch of sacks together. These are the Grant line ones that are now Rio Grande models made up again some little silicon molds and then cast these blocks of of um of sacks at the edge and then they were all just glued on i think i just used canopy glue to glue those on quite frankly and so that's basically those two buildings you see them back there and how they were built um and i took a few pictures so you can see inside so you know and one of the things i did inside here was um built ramps so that you could see how they would get the bags up here. Guy up here placing bags and trying to get them moved up. Got a guy here, got a guy here on the ramp pushing up some bags. Cause you know, the interesting thing is back at 1910, 1915, everything got moved by hand. Nothing got moved by forklifts. That kind of stuff didn't exist yet. So, um, and like I said, the, the, I put these slides in cause I did this, I did this at the national convention. Obviously I didn't carry that with me to Dallas. Uh, so the last thing I want to talk about was the little building back there. So I had that standard war, 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 standard oil wharf building. Um, I kind of, again, taken from these designs, I limited one of the things on, on, on modular is you're very limited in distance side to side. So because the pier came out this way, it had to be fairly short. And so what I figured out was that I had to shorten it by about half. So, but these were the buildings that I, you know, ended up, ended up modeling off of, wanted to get this idea of, you know, something up on the top of it. Um, there are some coffin, these actually were 3D printed, and this is actually a piece of PV site C pipe with uh, printed um, end caps and top and legs, and then some wrapped um, things that I did with rivets. But basically the idea was to recreate that scene there uh, with the building. When I did this one, what I did was something different was I actually did the wall siding as two pieces. Because what I realized if I did that one is you can generate more depth. And what makes a building look interesting is when you don't have inside siding on a building, what's really interesting is the depth of what you've got on the walls. So if you look here, and you can actually see it in this picture, what you have is you have the studs. And on the surface of the studs, you have the cross pieces. And then behind the studs, you have furring strips. And then you have the aluminum siding. So when you look in here, and unfortunately, I didn't get the lights on. So if you, have, if you take your phone and light it up, if you look at it, you can actually see there's a gap between the, the stud work here and the wall. And then there's even more of a gap here between this and the furring strips when you get up into these areas. We see so it actually begins to recreate that depth you get in a regular wall. Doing this by the way, you can do this with stick built building, but it's an awful lot of different pieces to glue together and try to get right. When you do it this way, it makes it pretty reasonable. Um, the other thing I did was I did a carrier at the top and you'll see that for the lighting. Uh, and the idea was to make this uh, a pretty cool building. The roof is actually, you'll see is a whole bunch of pieces. Each of the trusses was done as a single piece. There are two side pieces here that have the, the furring boards on them. And then there's there's basically a, a piece in the top. This was printed as two pieces and glued together because when you're on a filament printer, you only get dimensionality really in one direction up. If you wanna have things go up and down. So if you've got something you want that on both sides of, you cut it in half, print it twice, glue it together, and then you've got a single piece. Um, so this was the assembly process, which you see up there at the upper left are basically all the pieces. So, you know, this is the end wall with the door. This is the furring strips for that. This is the end wall without a door, furring strips for that. Um, and then these are the two side walls 
here, these are the uh, the two side walls here, and these are the furring strips. They're, these are turned 90 degrees to these. That's why it makes it hard to see. Those actually run across those. Those are the carriers for the roof. Those are the trusses. This is that, that top piece of the roof already glued together as a single piece. And then these are just tissue windows and a tissue door. I think grant line windows actually and a tissue door. And so the assembly steps are really simple as you glue basically after you do the paint finishing, you glue the furring strip to the appropriate wall. And then you just start putting those together here. And, you know, they get again clamped together. They have, they have guide, they have uh, guide pins in them top and bottom. Get clamped together and glued. Um, I did a little carrier here on the top for the lights. These are 3D printed light fixtures here with just an LED on them. These are designed to sit on the edge walls and you carry a brass rod to carry the lighting. Because when I did this, I knew I was going to want to do the um, lighting on the outside. So I needed more light capability. So this is kind of what it looked like uh, taking a picture there on the on the module. Uh, and kind of inside, you know, you again, you can see here really that dimensionality you get in the walls, which makes it look very realistic. Um, you know, and you can see it even when you look in the side windows. Uh, so last thing is uh, smaller wall sections. Um, so I have, I have a bag of parts here I can pass around. That's a bow scale uh, Sorry about for those of you on on Zoom. Sorry about that passing stuff around. So I actually passed these around. These are two by four wall sections um, printed in H O and N, or excuse me in in O and H O scale, and they're actually the ones I'm following around. The smaller one is obviously H O. The larger one is is um, is O. So it turns out, I mean, you can use this in HO, I think, pretty effectively as well as a building technique. Um, so you can see kind of the way the walls look. Um, again, these would be better if they were done the way that building was done back there with the cross pieces on top. Um, so kind of to close, um, some learnings and regrets. Um, make sections smaller than you think. It's, it makes it easier to print them. I'm um, going together, but that worked out pretty well the way it was. Um, filament wise, oh yeah, that that that's the interesting comment one. That, that that's actually in here. Um, use gray or lighter filament. So not clear, but gray seems to be the ideal filament because the darker you get, the more color pigmentation it has to have in it, and the more color and pigmentation, the harder it makes to get it to print well. So the gray filament seemed to work pretty well. Um, print flat, smaller sections down. Like I said, those walls back there were printed with the cross piece on the top, which meant there were supports underneath it, but just pop the supports off and you never see where it connects because that's on the back side towards the, the siding. Um, side grain looks like wood. Heating does not remove warps. So that one piece I was passing around that's all warped and weird, that was one of the roof pieces that came out and it was a little warped for some reason. And I thought, I have an oven that goes to 135 degrees. I'll put the oven on 135 degrees, put it in there and let it, yeah, it doesn't work. It just basically becomes weird. Um, if you want to straighten something out, there are two ways to do it. Turn the bed of the heater on to the 200 degrees, put it on there and put weights on it and it may settle out if it's a thin piece. But what I found is actually better is get a bucket of water and fill it with really hot water. So we keep our water for heater fairly hot, but so it's probably 140 degree water. And then what you can do is put the part in it and just let it sit for 15, 10, 15 seconds, take it out and feel it and you can start moving it. So I did an O scale, you know, railer, like the, you know, the railers you get in HO where you put them down, you roll a car down them. Didn't want an O scale and the fingers on it at the end ended up being weird when it got printed. And I put it in a bucket of water, lay it, then took it and laid it out on a towel with uh, weights on it, and it smoothed out perfectly. So a bucket of water is the way with filament printing to try to get things straight.
and, and, and doing that even so you may not succeed. Um, painting the filler primer is really important on the visible surfaces. Um, dry brushing is just becomes really important. I this whole process convinced me that dry brushing is the skill you really need to have in model railroading. Um, I was very concerned about that paint, that caramel was a semi-gloss paint because I thought it might show up afterwards, but it turned out after it had been dry brushed, the gloss just completely went away. So it just didn't matter at all. And you can see back there, there was not dull, there was not dull, it was not dull coated on the inside. Um, I might rethink the floor mounting, um, the way it's done. It'd be a little problematic at the edge of the walls. Um, the window dimensions can be very accurate. I was a little loosey-goosey, but um, in retrospect, as I've done it more, I've gotten more and more accurate. Um, I would have made the roof member smaller, like I said, but I decided it wasn't worth the effort. Um, the wiring, if you look at it, the trusses that don't have lighting are removable. The ones that have lighting are soldered into the lighting. The lighting basically runs front and rear. So it feeds from, you know, positive feeds from one side, negative from one side across those brass rods, which hits all the lights. So, and then they're just basically wires that run kind of daisy chain across the building. There are some center light poles in the middle. Um, anyway, that's, I think, about it. Yeah. Um, so when I did the gusset plates for the, for the roofs, I printed them in like 1.2 and I would have done them in 1.0. Actually, you know, there's a great scene. There's a great scene in, um, in, uh, what was his name? The, the Australian guy, um, uh, the Australian, uh, it was the Australian guy that came to the U S like, no, what's that movie? Oh, Crocodile Dundee. There's a great scene in there where the, I think it's in Crocodile Dundee too, where the guy walks out on the beach and there's the guy on the beach and he says, you don't have a gun. And he says, I don't need a gun. He's sitting there drinking a beer and the other guy's got a gun. He says, I don't need a gun. I've got a gronk. And then he turns around, there's this huge guy and he just goes bonk and the guy falls. <laughs> in. So kind of what turns out, I've got a friend. So Fran Foley has a filament or has a, a resin printer and he's a brilliant printer. So I would probably ask him to print those in resin if I did it again. Um, it would be much better in resin if you know somebody with resin. One of the nice things, if you've got a filament printer and somebody else has a resin printer, you've got to share the workload between them because filament works great for things that need strength. Like if you want to build a rail car, print the, print the frame in filament. And then you put the walls in resin and glue them to the frame. And now you've got a much stronger car than if it's all resin. Um, so anyway, that's about it. And I didn't change out the logo on this because this was the one for Texas Express. But but the URL still works if you want to get the get the presentation. Um, and I'll put I'll put a link up to it as well. So any questions, comments? Yes, sir. Um, Frank Foley's work, uh, if you look at that uh, CRA that I've got, you know, yep. uh, it's, that's Frank's work. Yeah, Fran, you know, what, so what Seth was saying, he brought in a, a CR8 engine, and, and that was actually Fran's printing. So, yeah, Fran does some pretty amazing. He's, he's, a much be, he's much better. He's actually the reason I've never bought a, a resin printer is because I look at Fran and I say I can never be as good as him. So, you know, you, man's got to know his limitations. Anyway, well, that's it for, well, yes, sir. It, it is fairly close to where the current road bridge is, exactly. That was where they used to be. And I think they kind of turned into the road bridge at that same place because that was, there was a, you know, or there was a road bridge, but really, you, I don't even call it a road, it was a cart bridge. And then there was the railroad bridge that ran out there. Yep. Um, and actually, I have a separate separate thing I did a couple of years ago that actually was kind of the whole process I went through with building and signing the module, which might be interesting. It has a lot of stuff in it. So I think I think it's somewhere online. I could find it. Well, anyway, we're going to take a we take a ten minute break. Ten minutes, good. And then the much more interesting clinic is Earl. 
and talking about animating and making things much more interesting in your models. And we're going to have pizza, so I assume everybody's interested in having a piece of pizza, so we will buy pizza for everybody. Cool. So 10 minutes. Thanks, guys. And for those of you online, we will come back in 10 minutes. Okay, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started now um, with Earl Gerbevon, and he's going to demonstrate why he is an MMR. Okay, so. Why he is a master model railroad oh. That's a designation to get. Okay. So there's a hint. I think I'm going to. So there's a handout going around for my presentation. If you look on the back of the handout, there's a map to the layout tours. And we'll talk about the layout tours later. Yeah, we'll have time for it. And Seth, there's extra copies up here if we need them. So before I get started with the presentation, um, like all you guys, I've got a whole big pile of magazines sitting around home that, you know, one day I'm going to go through and pull out the articles and clean them up. And I've actually started doing that. And I pulled up a model railroad, a magazine. No, it's not moving. Hey, yeah. Okay. Okay, we're having a little minor technical issue here. Okay. So in the back, you probably can't read this. Don't worry about it. This is model railroader from 1954. And it was interesting to look and see what hobby shops were around. The, uh, this is the actual date that I'm handing around to, that I'm handing around to the people here. But the interesting thing is that there is, um, here we go, a bunch of hobby shops up in Oakland. There's a couple in Palo Alto. And the interesting thing at the bottom here in San Francisco is that both uh, Macy's and the Emporium, I think it was, are advertising in Model Router, just to show you how things have changed. So this uh, obviously predates the train shop by quite a bit. So what I want to talk about today a little bit is things that kind of brighten up your layout and kind of bring a little more life to them. You know, the, the trains are the only thing that move on most layouts. Everything else is kind of dark and static and sometimes not too interesting. So as I've been working on different people's layouts, we've kind of done things to add some interest and just make them kind of a little more realistic. You know, we'll talk about lighting a little bit and we'll talk about animation. You know, animation gets hard. Everybody thinks of Lionel animation where it goes bang, 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 bang. And you want something that's more realistic. You can't see it from the people at home, but in the front here on the table is my elevator building. And that's been running here since we got in. There is an elevator that moves up and down and it moves up and down randomly between floors with random time delay between floors. So it's not a regular thing. It's a random thing like you would have in the real world. And finally, you know, one of my goals is to cost you guys money sometimes. So there's some really neat 3D printed parts that are coming out. 
uh, that I want to share with you. So it was hard to do animation, you know, some years ago. And there's a lot of things that have really enabled us to do it. You know, Phil talked a lot about 3D printing, a lot of that we're doing. The LEDs are more are less expensive. There's more form factors you can work with. Uh, there's a lot of other hobbies, especially robotics, that there's all kind of really neat parts out there today that are inexpensive. And, you know, if you don't mind paying Jeff Bose's uh, yacht gas fee, Amazon can get you stuff in a day or two, things that you would just never have thought were available. So this uh, picture, and I guess you guys, I assume you guys can figure out which layout this is. This is fine scale. This is George Selios. This picture with the uh, with the illuminated building was kind of the thing that got me into thinking about lights inside of buildings, that just to brighten them up. Obviously, if you want to do a night scene, you know, the lights really show up. But the lights all show up, also show up in the daylight. I'm sorry? We did? Am I there now? No? I already moved it up. Am I there now? Okay, hang on. It says I'm on. Let me, is this any better on Zoom? Testing one, two, but it's not on Zoom. Well, I can hear you fine. Okay, I'm going to keep going until we figure out the technical issue. So this is an area I'm working on on Ted Steen's layout. And, you know, the buildings are okay. They kind of, they sit there, but they're kind of dark. And then if you put lights inside, you can see that the windows are kind of lit up. And let me go back. Sorry for the different camera angle. But you can see that, you know, just brightening up the windows a little bit just adds a little more interest to the buildings. Otherwise, they're all just kind of black holes. So, you know, when we first started doing all these LEDs, we used to use just the little LEDs like these here. And I really haven't been using those much anymore. The, uh, I've got some things to pass around here. So one of the things are these really small 40 mil uh, LEDs. And I just passed a bag around of about two or three of them. And if you're wondering, are those bright enough to do anything? Then this is one of those LEDs. So they're, they're really super bright. The other thing that's really nice are these LED strips that you can buy, and I'll show you those in a minute. But uh, this just came out recently. This is from uh, We Honest, which is a uh, Asian import store on eBay. And it's a building light that already has the LED and a built-in resistor. So you don't have to play with resistors as much as you used to. The uh, LED strips, which are these guys, going forward for a minute, uh, are available actually at Home Depot now, and you buy them in a spool, and the spool has basically a lifetime supply of these LEDs. Yeah, something like 300, lifetime supply. When you buy the strips, you get them, it's either cool or warm. So if you're modeling kind of newer things where you want the bluer light, you get the cool. If you want to do the older incandescent lights and things like that, you buy the warm. And that's what you see up here. And again, these things are 
you know, 12, 15, 20 bucks at the absolute most. So they're actually a long strip. It kind of looks like this. And you can see there's pads where you just cut them for whatever you need, solder some wires, and you're good to go. If you want to tint the LEDs, there's a product called Gallery Glass that Michaels carries. And it comes in a number of colors. I use this kind of amber color quite a bit that really warms things up. Don't try to put the amber over the, the bluish light because you get this weird alien green light. Okay, so kind of buy the color that you need. Tamiya has this down here. It's a little bit harder to find, but the uh, gallery glass, think of it as tinted, tinted Elmer's glue. It works really good for just tinting the lights. And also if you need to make something red, uh, which we'll get into in a minute or two with you know fire and things like that, you can tint the LEDs. One of the things with LEDs that people get winked out about is the resistor. You gotta have a resistor for the LED. So people get worried about coming up with the right resistance. You don't gotta do that, okay? For most resistors, I power everything off 12 volts. For most everything, I put in the 2K resistor. It works just fine. The, the LEDs are rated for 20 milliamps. You really don't need to, or you don't want to run them at 20 milliamps. Run them half the current, you know, it's still more than bright enough to last forever. I'm sure the, uh, for the little chip legs, uh, like even half that is left. Yeah, so Seth was saying that even, you know, five milliamps for the small stuff. If you play with resistors, you'll see there really isn't that much difference in the brightness, and it just kind of protects you from being. So, as I've said down here at the bottom, you know, for a single LED, you know, 1K for 5 volts and 2K for 12 volts, that's all you have to do. And it's best to do one resistor per LED. Don't start daisy chaining them unless you need to. You know, these things take basically no current. You know, you can run 100 LEDs up for one amp and, you know, it just makes it easier. Don't, don't try to get fancy. So once you start thinking about lighting up interiors, then you have a problem. You got to put something in them. Well, one of the things people do is tint the windows. You know, you take some dull coats, spray it, and dull out the windows. But you know, if you have foreground structures, you can do a lot of detail parts in it. Uh, maybe you don't want to do that. So there are uh, 3D, there, there are printed interiors that you can buy from people, but you know, if you go online, and that's both of these images are things I've gone online and just found things with uh, Google Images, print them, and make your own interiors. If you want to stick people inside, there are figures available. These are, you know, the Asian import. These people don't have hands. They have flippers. Okay. They have, they're, they're terrible. There's no face. It's just a blob. They're painted god awful colors, but if you stick them inside something where you need like the silhouette, they're just fine. And, and inside a building, that's all you need. I use these when I did uh, passenger cars. I needed people in the passenger cars, you know, and I just cut off the legs if I needed to or did whatever. You know, don't spend a lot of money on the prizer figures, you know, just buy these cheapy ones. So that's some of the problems with you know, ramifications. There's also kind of another issue you wouldn't think of when you have lights on in buildings is that you never really know what your HO scale figures have been doing inside the buildings. But uh, yeah, okay. So the other problem is light leaks. When you start putting lights inside the buildings, uh, this is a building I was working on. It's a, their masonry windows you've got gaps all around the window and you got to seal them up or it just doesn't look good on the finished building. So if you've ever built a fine scale miniature kit, one of the things that George Chelios talks about is how to do roofing tar around 
roof stacks and things like that. So his method is this, which is 50-50, give or take, blue and whatever color that you want to use. And by the way, this is just like a credit card or a hotel room card or something like that. I use these for, for like putting glue on, you know, and picking up with a toothpick or something as opposed to paper or cardboard. So if you just take these, mix them together, put them on a toothpick, and this is a just a, a sharpened flat toothpick, you can get just a real small little dab of it and come around, you know, whatever gaps you have and fill them in. Or if it's a bigger gap, sometimes you can either get in there with the paintbrush, but typically, you know, just come in here with a sharpened toothpick with whatever color you need. So continuing with, with uh, the idea of lighting, the, uh, I think I need to produce it. So there's, I've been doing a lot of gooseneck lamps and these are kind of lights over a sign on the entrance to a building. There's a company called Microlumina that's out there. Also, they come under engineering and both of these are on the handout that you can go on to. They have come, they have this 18 mil diameter stainless steel tubing, which in round numbers is two inches in HO. And if you think about the 40 mil LEDs that I've passed around, that's about four inches in HO. So you're talking scale size light bulbs and scale size conduit to mount the lamps in. So if you take some titchy reflectors and then they have a, a bending fixture that you can actually use to bend this gooseneck, although I would think it might work with a pair of chain those pliers, but you can actually bend the, uh, the tubing to look like a gooseneck lamp. And again, this comes out to be scale size. It works out really nice. They also have 25 mil diameter stainless steel tubing. So, and it telescopes on top of the 18 mil. So if you need some really small pivots and things like that, this works out really good. They also have this LED tester and for the people that are here, I passed it around with an LED just to kind of show uh, what it looks like. Also with these really small LEDs, there's a fellow named Alvin Ho who has made working tricolor and scale signals. And this is again that 18 mil or so diameter tubing. And you can see kind of the wiring on the back. This is probably six or eight wires running down that tube. So these are scale size, pretty much end scale signals. We're gonna let the train pass here. So along with that, again, based from all these Asian importers, there's a lot of street lights and things like that that you can get both modern and old time and uh, a buck of pop, it's not too bad. So when you buy things, you know, the manufacturer comes back and says, this is HO or this is N scale or whatever. There's a fellow named Ed Loazzo, who is our local S scale person who's kind of out here in S scale land. Ed's theory is that everything you buy for your scale is pretty much oversized. So he buys HO scale things and figures those are probably in scale for S. So if you look at this, this uh, picture, these are actually N scale street lights. And I think they kind of look more HO than N. We did them as kind of coach lights, like for a more formal intro to this hotel. But uh, I think they actually look a bit more HO. So you got to find ways to connect all this stuff up under the layout. So. 
So there's, if you go online and look, there's a whole slew of different connectors and things like that. Usually when I'm wiring up building lights, I'll put spade lugs on the end of the wires because I don't know about you guys, but going underneath the, the layout kind of up like this, trying to hook up wires just doesn't work. So with uh, a spade lug, you can get on a terminal strip and uh, just hook them up real easy. What I'm passing around, and you guys can play with it if you want, is this connector. This is a push connector. So if you just push on the little end, you can connect and disconnect the wire. This has been, I've been using these for hooking up the street lights because you can just push the little wire in. Typically I'll, I'll solder the ends of the wires that are stranded just to kind of strengthen them, but just push them in here, slide them, and they work really good. And this is just a uh, power distribution. So all of this in a row is uh, one are all joined together and you just, you know, stick a wire in, screw them down. Well, I made some of these some also variable output stop by my band. Sure, okay, so Seth is saying he's built some of these up too, and we'll talk. You know, he's got quite a few things on his website, and we'll talk about some of those in a bit here. So, moving on, what we've looked at so far is just lights that turn on, turn off. But with Arduinos, there's things you can do to actually animate it. And this is one of the first things we did. These are some beehive. Uh, brick kilns on Seth's layout, and we looked at them and said, you know, we can do, we can do more with this. So if you're looking now, you can see that the lights are flickering inside the brick kilns, and it actually looks good. So again, we got some things kind of happening here. Now, before Arduinos came along, you used to have to wire everything up you know, with individual wires. And it was kind of really a pain in the butt. With Arduinos now, you know, the Arduino chip really is this. And it's a computer on a chip. And these things are, depending on the city of the economy, five or six bucks, maybe a bit more. You get a board that looks like this, put it together. And for 10, 15 bucks at the most, you have something that can do something. You just program it and it, and it kind of goes. So when you program an Arduino, you program a version of C, you do it on your desktop computer, compile it, download it into the Arduino, and it runs that program forever. So there's a site called Instructables. And this is one of the first sites I looked at when I was doing Arduino. And the flickering flame that you saw on these uh, beehive kilns and other things uh, pretty much came from this software. And it's this many lines. I've gone in and tweaked it on a number of things, but it's all pretty straightforward. And I talked about the gallery glass earlier, the tinting of the LEDs. So you can buy one color of LEDs and tint them or you can buy you know, different colors. The interesting thing is if you change the LEDs from the red and amber to like a blue and white, all of a sudden you've got a welder. So now we've got some guys kind of welding the pipe over here with scale size LEDs. So the Arduinos are not just on and off. You can also vary the intensity. So if you watch, and this one's gonna be a bit easier to see on this side. We now have aircraft warning lights on top of these towers. You can see the left-hand one, actually both of them kind of going on and on. So again, kind of just some animation, some interesting things going on. So, Arduino has a couple of really interesting functions to make all this randomness work. First off, there's delay. You can just say, I want to delay X number of milliseconds to give you some timing. 
but you don't want to have the same time all the time. So they have a random function and it, you give it a minimum and a maximum. In this case, you know, 3000 to 5000 millisecond. It picks a random number between basically three and five seconds and delays. And the nice thing, and I've got that on my elevator company too, it doesn't do the same thing every sequence. There's random times in between things. On this elevator company, for instance, the floor numbers, again, are random. It just picks a number between you know, the first floor and the fourth floor and just goes back and forth with a random time between floors. And it works really good for something like this. So this again is going to be a welding company, but the guys aren't welding all the time. You know, most of the commercial modules that you get, the welding's going on all the time. The guys don't weld all the time. So if you've got some delays built in, you can see it, the welding goes on and on. Again, kind of more realistic way of looking at how all this works. So going on to a little bit of animation. Yeah, you know, I mentioned some of the enabling technologies. The robotics industry is the new hobby industry for a lot of the younger generation. There are a whole slew of different kind of robots out there, people putting GPSs, vision, all kinds of stuff on them. So there's now this whole plethora of different parts out there that were never available before. The, the, with motors, with servos, again, 3D printing and things just having really, really short lead times. One of the things that I've been, I've, are some of these plastic gear assortments. So you got tons of different gears, they all fit on two, mil, two millimeter shafting, uh, just all kind of parts. And this is actually a chain that you can buy. And I use this on something and we'll, we'll see some of that later. So, so one of the first things that uh, I came across using are these servos. These are actually servos for model planes, but they work really good for just very simple motion. They basically have 180 degrees of motion. And the way you control them is by giving it a pulse frame with different pulse widths. Different pulse width is different degrees of rotation. Uh, for Arduino, this works really good. There's a library in the Arduino that does all this for you. So this is one of the first uh, things we did with this. This is on Seth's layout. I helped with the mechanics, but a fellow named Charlie Bedard actually did the animation. And there's three of these servos associated with this. And the most important one runs this little pin over here. And then there's one for each gate. So what this pin does, it keeps people from running into the gate when it's closed. It's, it has saved the gates a number of times. You know, this is, you know, we run ops on Ted's layout, right? You get new people to pushing a string of cars. You have to have some uh, safety things built in. So we, as we watch it run now, you see it's the guys opening the right gate. And you walked over, you opened up the left hand gate. Again, we didn't do it at the same time, thinking this is someone doing it. And now the pin has gone down. And now we're going to close them so the pin came back up. And we're closing the gate. We actually figured that out first. <laughs> We did. We thought about my first. <laughs> this has literally saved the gate a couple of yeah, times. Yeah. <laughs> so the other interesting thing that's out there are separate motors, and uh, I don't have one handy. So these, if you know what the separate motor, I think there's some motor sound. 
So stepper motors are some are just move in discrete steps. And the stepper motor that, that we're using and showing here, I think it's 512 steps per revolution. It's geared down. You can move it pretty slowly. And again, there's an Arduino library that controls all this. Yeah, I showed before some boards you, you can buy that, uh, you know, the Arduino patches into. This requires a driver board. So you can see the driver board up here. Yeah. You don't want to deal with, you know, doing the driver board and cabling everything together. Seth has a couple of different boards on his website. Uh, you saw one in this previous slide. Down here in the corner for controlling a servo. And there's also one that's actually a dual stepper motor board. So you can talk to Seth if you want to play with some of this Arduino. That all the all the wiring, all the interconnects are there. There's terminal strips to plug in a home sensor for all that. You know, Phil talked about 3D printing. And when you're doing mechanics, sometimes you need mounting and bracketry and things like all that. So I had to do an animation project recently and needed some kind of custom bracketry. So this is Tinkercad. This is uh, what Fran Foley and I both used to draw parts. And you can see kind of a part here in progress. As Phil mentioned, you kind of, you import shapes and scale them and kind of stick them together. And you can see the various colors here. Each of these different colors is a different shape that I've brought in and imported. I don't know why it keeps moving ahead on me. So, and then these kind of grayed out areas here these are holes. So you take a shape, make it a, a hole, and it's a hole. I mean, th this is as complicated as it is. So the nice thing with this, I was able to make a bracket that held the stepper motor down in here. And then, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm making these kind of things, the wires are always in the way. You need to have strain relief for the wires or some kind of routing. So this is actually a, a routing for the wires and strain relief. You know, we've talked about 3D printing. I bought my 3D printer a couple of years ago. I think I paid 350 bucks for it at the time. I looked at Amazon just the other day and there's a 3D printer out there for 169 bucks. So the price of this stuff is really, really going down to make all this affordable. So this is an animation project that I just finished up. And this is a crane that moves a load of logs from the truck over to the right. John? And you can see that yeah. it kind of moves at probably typical you, speed. Um, throw this the, uh, move is takes about a minute to do. Turn out. Yeah. Okay. Now. Oh, that's weird. Okay, what's going on now? Okay, so we have the fog to the correct side. So the good news is kind of boring to watch because it takes a whole freaking minute. But if you were doing this in real life, it would probably take even longer time than this. So I, I mentioned a little bit earlier about these really neat Arduino functions, right? About delay and random, how random is really good. Well, random has a problem. It's a computed 
random number. So like on my elevator company where I didn't, that's the way it works right now. It does the same sequence each time. It's a random sequence, but it does the same sequence. So the analogy is if you were to use the Arduino to make a slot machine and the slot machine had the jackpot on the 10th pull, it would always hit it on the 10th pull, even though it may be seem to be random. So there's another function in Arduino called random C, where you leave a pin open, it's the voltage is fluctuating, it just grabs a random voltage and gets a random number, a truly random number. For most cases, it doesn't really make any difference, right? Because like for my elevator company or this flickering, you don't have anything to compare it to. On the other hand, if you have something that has multiple things at the same time. And I, this is my uh, ore loader that was at the Ronard Park Convention a couple of years ago that if you guys were there and you should have been, you would have seen it. And this is uh, six ore loaders running with six Arduinos, the ones that I showed you that Seth built, running simultaneously. And again, I did the random seed so that all of this motion is random. Otherwise, you would get the two things next to each other tracking all the time. There's random delays each time. There's random speeds like you would have in the prototype, different guys running them at different speeds. And it just runs back and forth. I don't know if you notice these counterweights also move along with the booms. So enough about things I did. There's a guy out there by the name of David's Animation Workshop. Uh, Paul Hansen, who works with us at TED's, turned me on to this. This is a guy that does animation in N scale. So if he can do it in N, we can do it in H O or more. One of the things he has is exhaust fans. What I'm passing around right now is a little motor that I found on eBay. It's a little geared down three volt motor running at one and a half volts that would be perfect to run a fan or something like that. So he's got N scale exhaust fans working in a building and this would work also for a cyclone roof fence running about the same speed. He's got an N scale Bobcat. And what happens with the Bobcat is it, it pulls in, it, it actually brings up the bucket, turns on the backup lamps, pulls over here, moves forward, dumps the bucket, you know, turns on the lamps and moves back and forth. The link is on the handout. Go take a look at some of the things okay. he's done. He's also animated an excavator. So you can see all of his motors and limit switches and all that. And in end scale, kind of interesting. He does a lot of this just with, with threads and things like that since things are pretty small. But uh, just amazing the animation that he does. I talked earlier about you know LEDs and modules and things that are available. This company called We Honest has an eBay store. There's two or three Asian importers that you can get all this stuff. It's actually pretty expensive, pretty inexpensive. And you can see a lot of different things are kind of available now out on the web. So if you're on Phil's Saturday morning talks, uh, and you should be because Phil puts a lot of time and energy and effort into these. I've been kind of a, a sales pitch for Sierra West. They've come out with a whole slew of really, really neat 3D printed things. Uh, he just came out with a whole set of tractors, you know, from the 40s and 50s. Actually, there's even a newer one that came out now. These are all available in HO and a no scale. And a couple of these are actually 
in S. So all this stuff runs 30 to 40 bucks, depending on what it is you're buying. But the detail is incredible. And these are pretty much five pieces. It's the tractor and the wheels, and you put them together. He's come out with a portable air compressor, which I've just never seen before. And there's also a whole kind of blacksmith shop. The, uh, the actual uh, fire here, this is actually hollow with like a, a see-through grate. So if you wanted to go back to that flame effect, you could put the flame effect inside and have the fire going on inside the, uh, the forge. He's also come out with a whole set of gas pumps. There are in both HO and O, there are Coke machines with Coke bottles or beer bottles with individual bottles. He's got the bottles in clear plastic. Just incredible kind of thing. These are the old loopsters that you had at the gas stations, how you bought oil. This is probably one of the more incredible things. This is, you know, the old hand-mounted drill press. And I, I think what happens when he designs and designs them either, you know, full size or half inch or whatever, and then just shrinks them down to different scales. If you look at the HO version of this drill press, there's the flutes in the drill. And if you, if this was flipped over, you'd actually see the teeth on the gear. So the, the detailing is just incredible uh, on all these parts that are available. So the, one of the last things I want to show you in the way of costing you guys money, we all use the owner's glue, right? And those orange caps, after you use them for a while, kind of gum up, you can't clean them, you say a lot of bad words, you can't take them apart. I found these on uh, on Amazon. And again, these part these screw on to the Elmer's glue box. So for 13 bucks, you get 36, you got a lifetime supply. And when your caps get all screwed up, you know, put these on, you can unscrew them and clean them. And it saved me a lot of grief and aggravation. So anyways, what I hope I showed you is just some of the things that you can do to kind of bring some life and some animation to your layouts. Yeah. Any questions? Okay, so what we have coming up in here. Okay. Okay, so there's a question about LEDs. Let me go back up. So if I'm answering the question properly, so when I wire up LEDs, I just do one resistor to one LED, hook it up to 12 volts like this. If you start daisy chaining them, some of these wires are really small diameters. They break, they're hard to solder. So this is just a real simple way to do it. Yes, you can do two or maybe three LEDs in series, but it just makes it problematic. Okay, on to layout tours. So on the back of the uh, presentation is a is a map with all the layouts. The Cal Central Club is open. They're kind of down Lafayette the other way. Uh, Seth is going to be open. And also Bob Brown, who normally isn't open for these things, is going to be open along with Jed Stevens. If you're looking at layouts, I would recommend, you know, Bob Brown turned 90 this year. Okay. 
And also Ted Stevens is having some health issues. So if you're going to see layouts, I would kind of recommend making sure you get up to see those two layouts uh, today as you go. Ted's layout, Ted Stevens' layout is in an industrial building. It's an industrial tilt up, it's not a house. So as you pull in the driveway, we'll have to go down the driveway a little bit. We'll have the cross flex out to show you where the layout is. The entry to the layout is via the back doors and the doors will be open. And Seth is going to be open. I'm kind of halfway in between. Yeah, and Seth, you can see, is kind of in between. What we try to do is cluster the layouts together so you guys wouldn't be driving all around. So I think with that, uh, okay, come on up. So we're going to uh, segue over to Seth for just a minute for the signals. Bill Gibbard. Oh, wow. A oh, louder voice. Uh, yeah, project. Uh, just short and sweet. The uh, annual Bay Area. What? Oh, talk to the talk to the hand. All right. Uh, uh, annual Bay Area. Uh, SIGME uh, design and operations will be in Santa Rosa. The main program will be Saturday, February 3rd, uh, as usual, the week between playoffs and Super Bowl. And uh, we're going to have some tours available on Friday, early in the or mid afternoon, to get you north of the Golden Gate and the San Rafael bridges before the uh, awful North Bay traffic starts. Uh, there are several hotels in the area if you want to stay over. Uh, the main clinic and uh, panel program will be on Saturday, and we'll have uh, tours Saturday evening, and Sunday we'll have uh, tours and op sessions. So, you know, there'll be more on the list and more in the uh, Coast Dispatcher and the branch line. Thanks. The other thing I should mention since I'm co-chair is we have the upcoming PCR convention the end of April next year. We are going to have the hotel rooms bookable on, online in a couple of weeks. So please plan on attending that. We need clinicians and clinics. So if you've ever thought about doing a clinic, uh, please get in touch with Bill, myself, or Dave Gibbons. Uh, we'll be happy to help you on any kind of clinic you want to do.